Hi folks and welcome to the channel. Um, in this episode I'm going to take you through a very detailed building of this DIY custom lithium ion phosphate battery. Uh, <clears throat> truth be told I, I really really like this um, partly because it's it's very strong, the, the cells are compressed optimally for, for long life and for stability. Uh, it uses a 200 smart DALI BMS, which is really great for running uh, high draw appliances like coffee machines and uh, um, various stove tops, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's about as compact as we can get it, uh, very strong. I think it looks quite nice and uh, it functions really, really well. Uh, we've sold a lot of these actually building custom batteries and, and people have actually really, really enjoyed these. So we thought we'd make this very detailed uh, video so that uh, we talk you through end-to-end uh, -end the whole process. Uh, if you're an absolute novice and know nothing about lithium-ion phosphate batteries, uh, this should help you immensely in building them. So <clears throat> what you're going to land up with is a battery that is basically 210 millimeters wide or eight and a quarter inches. In, in terms of length, it is uh, 32 and a half millimeters long or just under 13 inches, so just over one foot. And in terms of height, um, it is, uh, I'll bring this around here, so it is uh, 33 centimeters or 330 millimeters and 13 inches high, exactly. Um, just to uh, contrast that with a standard uh, drop-in replacement size, just be aware I said size because you may also need to change wiring if you go for one of these. So this, this is a standard battery size more or less. So it's 250 or 10 inches high. And in terms of length, it is slightly longer, three, 70 with the handles, 350 without the handles, or four, roughly 14 inches. And uh, in terms of width, it's just wide enough to hold the cells with a bit of padding. So 185 with uh, all the little edges and that. So <clears throat> this is the standard drop-in replacement size. Uh, this is a custom DIY and um, it uses, uh, we, we have based all of this on the fact that you're going to buy or have bought standard cells that are 72 millimeters wide, uh, 200 millimeters high without the terminals and um, 175 millimeters uh, in width. So 72 thick, uh, 200 high, 175 um, wide. And you will have bought four of them or are going to buy four of these with at least four bus bars. So hope you enjoy this video. In this segment of the video, we're gonna take you through in a lot of detail, uh, all of the components, consumables, essential tools, and some of the optional tools that uh, you would use to construct a battery. Now, as you can see on this table, there's actually, it's quite busy, there's quite a lot going on. Some of these things you would have anyway, um, and some of these uh, you wouldn't have. So <clears throat> let's start with the, uh, the components and the essential parts of the components. The most essential part obviously would be your four uh, lithium ion phosphate prismatic cells. Now these are uh, EVE cells, they're 280 amp hour. Um, they uh, measure exactly 72 millimeters across by 175 long and the cell itself is 200 millimeters high with uh, the studs of the terminal sticking up. So we, we generally say with the terminal, they're about 230 millimeters high. So those are the dimensions. So all four put together will be 288 um, millimeters across. I'll be uh, covering just the whole process of top balancing and what you need to look out for in a cell. But uh, <clears throat> with the cells should be uh, at least four bus bars. This is how they are generally sold unless you request more bus bars. And uh, each terminal will have a nut and uh, you probably want to get uh, a bunch of washers like this. They don't generally sell them with the washers, uh, but they just, the washers make it a lot easier to put the, the nuts onto the, um, onto the balance leads without twisting the balance leads around. So we quite like using washers. So that's the cells, bus bars, and uh, nuts, etc. 
Uh, you would want, <coughs> you, uh, in this build, we're assuming that you're going to use a DALI uh, 200 amp smart BMS, so uh, 200 amp there, and it's a 4S 12 volt 200 amp smart BMS. Uh, it will come with uh, the balance leads, which are these leads here, uh, which we're going to take you through the whole process of terminating things. Uh, it, it already has a temperature probe um, plugged into it, but this, it plugs into the NTC port here. Uh, and at the end of there, that is the actual temperature probe itself. And it will have, and you need to make sure that you order this because it's usually an optional extra on the DALI website, on Alibaba or AliExpress. Uh, you need to order this Bluetooth dongle. So <clears throat> this will be plugging into the side of the BMS here. It's not absolutely essential, but I just can't see why you wouldn't want this. It only costs about three dollars or so, three pounds, three dollars or so. So that's the BMS. In terms of uh, ongoing with the components, uh, we've made these up, and we'll show you the process where we actually construct these two ply ends, and then we have a um, bottom to to go on the floor, and we have a top. This will be the lid that goes on the top. And we have two bars to uh, put onto the shelf here. The two bars will be going on the shelf there, and that is where the BMS mounts onto. So as I said, we'll take you through in detail just how you would construct these. Um, together with these, <coughs> uh, you would have um, at least four one foot or 300 millimeter uh, thread bars. We've used M6 thread bars. There's no, no need to make it uh, stronger than this. Uh, M6 is, is more than enough for what you want to do. Um, you also would need four connector. Uh, these are joint connector nuts. So you see they're tightening with an Allen key and uh, that uh, screws onto the thread bar. So <clears throat> in terms of components, uh, those are the m main components. You then also would need uh, some uh, red cable, which we are assuming you're going to run straight to a bus bar or a fuse or directly to your inverter or whatever you're doing. So you would need to just work out the length. You don't want too many connections along the way because each one you can, uh, you know, it, it can build up heat. So you want to go with a fairly thick cable. This is uh, to a 2 AWG um, or 35 millimeter. It's quite a good cable. It's it's well capable of carrying the amperage that the BMS can can carry. Uh, <clears throat> you want two lugs to terminate uh, the two ends of this red cable. So you're going to want at least a six millimeter lug which fits over your terminals quite nicely. Uh, and then the other lug will depend where it's going. If you're going to for example, a, um, a Victron Smart Shunt, uh, an 8mm is not enough, you need a 10mm lug on the other side. So it all depends where you're terminating as to what size lug you're going to get. And uh, just, we've, we've chosen an 8mm because quite often that's what most of the bus bars are, etc. that you go to. You probably want some heat shrink uh, to uh, put over the, once you um, crimp the lug onto the cable, you're gonna wanna put some nice heat shrink on there. Uh, <clears throat> continuing with all of these things, you, you're going to want um, some terminals to uh, terminate the, the balance leads. So, so if you have a look at the balance leads, uh, they just terminate, they just bear wires at the end. Um, you're going to need to cut back a little bit more of the insulation and terminate all five of these. So one black and four red. And we're going to take you through that process in detail. Um, I've shown you these blue because uh, quite often you want to terminate the, the black one with the blue just to differentiate. But uh, just bear in mind that uh, the color actually denotes the size. And uh, <clears throat> we don't think it's a good idea to have such a big hole that you need to then crimp closed. Um, so we would say don't actually bother getting these blue terminals. Just stick with these 
where these are more pink than red, I guess. Um, but just stick with five of these. Um, you can't mistake, this is the black lead. You know, it's got a red or a, or a pink uh, terminal on it. You, you just can't mistake it, that should be fine. So five of these is what you will need. I just want to show you two different types of lugs. So these are 35 by eight, and this is also 35 by eight. You can see this one, the, the edge is flanged out a little bit. This makes it a lot easier to insert the cable that you're gonna crimp. This one where it's not, where it's not flared out at all, it makes it quite difficult to get the cable in without a few strands coming out and going loose. So I would recommend don't go for these if you can, I'd rather go for these where it's flared out like this and really easy to get the cable in. I'm gonna take you through uh, some of the tools, well, all of the tools that we think you are going to need. Um, I'm going to exclude all the tools that you would use to make this up. I'm assuming you've got uh, saws and um, drills and uh, play, you know, either planers or sanders or something like that to make these up. And as I said, we'll take you through uh, quite detail of how you could actually make these up. But uh, aside from the, the tools and the spray paint and the glue and the tacks and everything else, uh, let's exclude that for now. In order to um, build the battery, you will need to top balance it as well as uh, charge it at its uh, final voltage. And uh, to do that, you've got two options basically. One is to buy a charger like this, and we'll put a link down in the in the video. And uh, this is a variable voltage or variable current. You can set quite a few things. You can see by these knobs here. So you could top balance at 3.65 volts with this, and then do your final uh, full battery charge at 14.6 volts. These are relatively um, inexpensive at about 70, 80 pounds or dollars, I think. Um, or you could buy a very cheap, this is a, this is a very inexpensive uh, charger that is set at 3.65 volts. We're assuming that you've got a 14.6 volt charger anyway, because how else would you be using the battery in whatever you're using it? So. Uh, all, we're assuming that all you need over and above that is a 3.65 volt charger. This is uh, pretty good. It's elementary, no dials or displays or anything. You just simply plug it in and it outputs 3.65 volts and or charges something to 3.65 volts. So as I said, we'll include the link to this. Uh, very inexpensive and a good option because it's, it's pretty much a single use for you. Um, you need, you have to top balance, and we'll explain all that when we get to the top balancing part. Uh, you have to top balance, you don't really have an option for that. And you have to have a charger capable of 3.65 volts. And so to a large extent, this becomes single use for you. So you may as well buy one off AliExpress, uh, use it and then sell it on eBay or something like that. Um, <clears throat> this over here is a Again, a fairly inexpensive 14.6 volt charger. Uh, you can see we've connected up some leads with some crocodile clips. Uh, looks identical to the other one, but it's set at 14.6 volts, and I think it charges at about 15 amps. Uh, so quite a, quite a good one to have around. Again, very inexpensive, but again, we're assuming that you have a charger in your vehicle or your boat or your cottage or wherever this thing is going that is capable of charging at 14.6 volts. So the charger is absolutely essential and it does add to the cost of your DIY battery. Obviously, if you were buying a, a pre-built battery, you wouldn't need to worry about top balancing, assuming that they've done it for you. Uh, other tools that you will need to have, uh, you will need your crimping tools. We've included two different types of tools here for you just to see. Uh, this is by far our preference for the big cable. So this is for this big cable here, uh, a hydraulic print, a crimper like this. Uh, we have used these reasonably extensively, but uh, I, we, this is our go-to. Uh, this I haven't used for sure, about a year now. I just don't touch it because this thing does, does it so well. So you will need uh, your crimping tools. Uh, this is quite a nice thing to have. This is a cable cutter. 
it's difficult to cut these thick cables. You're not going to use your side cutters like this to cut a cable like that unless you're Mr. Iron Man. Um, but yeah, this this is really good. You get your cable in there, it just goes cuts through the cable with this blade here and uh, it works really well. So, or you could buy the cable exactly to length and not worry about this. Uh, these are the small crimping tools and I've had, I've got two of them here. And before we have a, a hate session, this is, this has been with me since 1980, uh, the early 80s. Uh, you can see it's very worn. I, I, I have crimped thousands and thousands of lugs with this one and it, it works amazingly well, but uh, you've got to know how to use it. Uh, in this modern day and age, these uh, sort of ratchet crimping tools are far easier. And uh, this is what we'd suggest you probably get. We'll include links down below as to uh, which crimpers. Uh, we're assuming that you're going to be building out and doing other stuff. So a crimping tool like this is going to be necessary anyway. Um, and again, the, the big crimping tool may be something that uh, you can borrow or, or get somebody to make the cable once. But there again, if you're building a van art or something like that, you're going to be wanting to crimp more than one cable, so you might want to get your own. This is a simple urban uh, cable stripper. You don't have to have this. You can do it with a knife you know, or a Stanley knife, but um, this does make life easy. Uh, some standard things like um, Stanley knives, uh, multimeters, tape measures. Uh, you'll want a small torque wrench unless you're pretty good at tightening things by feel. Uh, so this is a like a cyclist uh, torque wrench. Uh, works really well. Uh, we torque down the terminals. We torque down to eight newton meters with this. Um, a few drill bits. Uh, the heat heat gun, and we've got a full list of everything. Uh, that you can look at. So this is the, the heat gun to uh, run the heat shrink onto the cable. Uh, obviously scissors, Allen keys, and uh, uh, drill driver. So we use DeWalt um, to drill holes plus to drive the screws. Uh, I think that's about it in terms of all the tools, but we'll see as we, as we go on, uh, you'll see what we actually do what we use. So now we've uh, shown you all of the components and the tools. Um, from here what we're going to do is we're going to actually construct these into the housing. Uh, then we are going to top balance the battery and uh, take you through extensively what you do with the top balancing and an easy way to do it. Uh, and then we're going to do the final connections of all the bus bars etc. Turn the BMS on and do the final checks and that will be the battery completed. So I'm preparing the ply ends uh, for the DIY battery and my preference and you can do this the way you want and you might have a lot of woodwork knowledge in that my preference is to use two nine millimeter boards so you could buy a standard 1.2 by 600 from your hardware store um, nine millimeter and I cut them about 215 millimeters wide that's because when I'm finished I'll just plan them down but uh, anything from 210, even even slightly less than 210 would be okay. Uh, so the first one is 230 millimeters high and that goes above this uh, and then the other one is 300 millimeters high. So that the total height of the side excluding a bottom piece and a top piece will be 300. So with the bottom and the top about 312 millimeters in total. Now I do this, the, the cell as you can see uh, it fits in quite nicely so there'll be this here, this shelf will be used uh, to run a, a bar across that the, the uh, BMS mounts on top of and uh, on the sides of these there's plenty of room for uh, these connector nuts. So I use 17, these are 12 mil but I'll be using 17 mil connector nuts that'll sit outside uh, to run some bars, some thread bars through. So what I do is I take these two boards, I've got one prepared here, and uh, I put a bunch of glue on, and I take this and 
Now what I've done is I have got two tacks in the corners because when you actually compress it, um, it tends to slide around a bit. So this way I get it exactly square and then I get my hammer and I drop that in, drop that in. Now when I clamp it, it can't slide around. It's nice and square. So that's how I would recommend you do this. Let me do the other one quickly. I put these tacks right in the corner where they could never come into contact with the battery, even if somehow you get one that's slightly too long and it protrudes out. And I put some ends on, some end there, and an end here. <coughs> get my G clamps. Right, there, I've got everything glued and uh, now I'll just let it dry. I'll take you through the next process after it's dried up. Now, as I said, I used two 9mm that I glued together uh, just because I like this uh, shelf that it creates there. Um, but you can do it anyway. You can do it uh, with the 18mm ply and, and mount the BMS on in a different way if you want to. Uh, I just find this way really works well for me. Right, let's get them in the warmth to dry. It's uh, below 10 degrees and as you know, glue doesn't really dry below that. So let's get these into a warm place. Right, so I took these two ends out of the clamps. <clears throat> They're totally dry and uh, nicely set. So we have two nice ends that will sit like that with the four cells in between. And uh, this gives us a nice little shelf that we'll rest the bars on for the BMS. Now, what I've done, I have this little template that I use for everything. Uh, it is exactly the same size as a cell. Uh, so you see if I hold it against here, you can see it's precisely the dimensions of a cell. So it's just easier than lugging a cell around, it's easier to use this. Now what I've done here, and just bear with me if I'm... Uh, teaching you to suck eggs because you might have really good woodwork knowledge and structural knowledge. What I've done here is that this is where the cells will sit. So right at the bottom, uh, I've left enough space to put, to drill a 10 millimeter hole for a, a connector nut over here. And there, and four connector nuts. So we'll have four connector nuts coming through here. You can bring these virtually right against the cell if you if you want to, you know, one or two millimeters so the cells can't move at all. There's not really much point to it. Obviously, connect this lip will be on the outside so it won't come into contact with the cell. So we're going to drill a 10 millimeter hole exactly where these crosses are uh, for the four thread bars. Now, I've marked where I'm going to drill the holes for uh, the handle. We've just roughly drawn out where the handle will be. It'll actually be a 25 uh, millimeter handle which is fine for most people's thumbs uh, so one inch hole um, one inch high <clears throat> I'm going to uh, drill pilot holes over here first and then use a force a bit now um, this is 40 millimeters from the top and 60 millimeters from the side uh, these I've made slightly wider than I normally do just I mean I normally do them 210 millimeters, these are 212 ish millimeters. What I actually do is I, I actually make them 215 and then I plane these two sides. So, but you may not have a planer, so just make them roughly 210 or a little bit more and you'll be fine. So, we're going to go ahead and drill these out. I'm just going to put them one against the other and, and drill straight through the drill press and then drill two pilot holes and then uh, drill through the force a bit so we prepare these. So that's the two ends. Uh, the, the bottom is this bit of old ply I found that I've cut to exactly the right size. So basically these, these you need to make um, essentially 288 millimeters plus the width of the two sides. So in my case these are 36 millimeters. So this part is 288 plus the two sides put together to form your uh, floor and your roof. And these are identical, different thicknesses, but uh, same dimensions. Right, 
let's get to it. So just holding these back to back so that I drill through one place, a uh, 10 millimeter drill. Um, I have a sacrificial piece of plank because when you break through you don't want to splint to the bottom so this will mean that it breaks through quite cleanly. So let's go for it. Beautiful, nice and clean. Right. I'm going to drill the two pilot holes for the handle cut out. So you don't have to uh, paint the, all the ply bits black as, as I do, but uh, it looks a lot nicer. I mean, the, the end product is, is so much nicer when all of this is painted black. But if you want natural wood, then um, go ahead and just leave it exactly like this and put it together. Uh, the black doesn't help with anything, just looks good. Looks, key, looks um, cool, I think. So that's what I'm going to do now, just paint all of these. The way I'm going to paint this is, I don't need to paint this part here because this is where the cell comes against here. So I'm going to start off by just painting all the outsides here. That. Right, I'm just preparing everything to actually assemble this battery pack. So let me cut uh, four tubes. So I'm cutting these to go the full length of the battery, of the four cells. And the purpose of this tubing is to protect the cells from the, uh, th the threads on the thread bar in case they actually shift. They shouldn't shift, but just in case something happens and they do shift, uh, we don't want the thread bar actually touching the aluminium of the prismatic cell. So this is um, <coughs> a six millimeter internal diameter and nine milli millimeter external diameter. That's quite a trick to getting it onto here. You've got to sort of straighten it and push it down. Okay, I've um, <coughs> put the, the plastic tubing on all of the thread bars. Um, I'm going to take a connector nut. Now, what I do is I, I look at how, how much thread I want this to go on initially and uh, get this on and sometimes you need to fiddle around. There we are. Just screw it to that point there. And I'll bring this. Now, I've cut these holes big enough for the, uh, the tube to actually go through, so it just makes it easy like that. And then, as you can see, it just comes loose there. Then we get the other connector nut to close all of that. Now I will be tightening on this side. And I'll just repeat that for all four of these. I'm putting on about six millimeters of thread. When these arrive, they are at about 30%, 25-30% state of charge, which is what they need to be to ship them. Um, and what all we're going to do is we're going to take up all the slack. 
because when they're charged to 100%, they will swell slightly. All cells, no matter what the quality, will, sell, will swell slightly. Uh, bad quality cells will swell more than good quality. Um, and some of them will even arrive almost uh, with it like a, a concave uh, surface. But, um, you know, even those when they actually charge to 100% state of charge will swell out. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to just tighten them so that they can't move in here. Not, not anymore, just stop them from from shifting because when they actually charge up they'll be pretty tight in here and when they discharge completely they'll actually be slightly loose so what all, all that we're doing is to stop excessive swelling basically I know there are more scientific methods uh, involved with uh, working all of this out but uh, we found that this really does work for us it's not a problem there we are <coughs> First one is tight, and you can, if you want to, you can uh, use a torque wrench to get these to an exact pressure. So really what I'm doing is I'm taking them up, um, taking up all the slack you see if on the short bit there, if, I, I don't know how strong your fingers are, but mine are sort of average, and I'm taking up all the slack just with that, and uh, they can't move anymore. Uh, this, they were slightly convex uh, these so I'm just taking up a little bit of that space in fact, I'm going to just give this one a little bit more not much just a little bit more pressure and I might come and uh, just let them settle in and nip them in later some people use uh, elaborate things with springs and all sorts of stuff like that I don't think you need to worry about the science too much just make sure they're not swelling uncontrollably and uh, yeah, so this should be good. Uh, we don't normally, with these quality cells, we don't normally see a gap. This is about a millimeter gap, so it's bulging out here. Uh, a bit more than I'm used to, um, but that's fine. We'll, we'll be fine with that. Let's put the bottom on. So I'm gonna just turn this on its side. As you can see, the cells are not uh, moving anymore. Drill the first hole. About there. You can countersink these if you want, but this should pull in quite nicely. Going in nicely. Roughly in the middle. So the arrangement uh, that we'll be <coughs> showing you is putting it together shortly. So we're going to splice this in just to show you what we're actually getting to. So we're aiming for this configuration. Basically, uh, you've got a negative there, negative, 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 obviously positive, positives. So in this way, we're going to make this the main negative terminal and this the main positive terminal. And we're going to be placing three bus bars, one here, one here, and one there. So that will form, uh, we'll put the four cells into series to form the 12 volts. So what we've done is we've um, actually put them into the enclosure uh, at about 25-30% state of charge, which is how they arrived. And uh, there are a number of ways that you can do this, but this is the way that we prefer it. Um, <clears throat> we're about to top balance it now, which basically means we're going to put all four cells 
into series. Now, most people would take the cells out, uh, top balance them completely outside, and then bring them into an enclosure. Uh, we just prefer to do it this way because we, we basically, we don't clamp them hard, we just basically secure them into place at uh, 25, 30 percent state of charge and then we bring them up to full charge which means that they swell out a bit and then they are really really tight. Uh, we found when we discharge these completely the cell you could actually move them by hand so that's pretty much what we're aiming at. Now in order to uh, top balance these the all, all of the top balance charges are pretty much only capable of about 10 or 15 amps and so what what we would suggest, rather than you spending um, extra money on, on bus bars that you'll only use ever once for top balancing and then put them on a shelf and forget about them, uh, you don't need much to uh, connect these in series. And I'm going to show you quickly. So basically, this is normal household. This in, in this case, it's one and a half millimeter wire. Just normal electrical wire that you'd wire your house up with. So we take out the, the ends bits, like that, and that. Um, so, let's see where I'm going to bring them, out there to there. So this is really quick and easy to achieve. I use a Stanley knife to cut that little bit out. So that goes from there to there roughly. So we, we are ready <clears throat> with this very simple, very simple arrangement. Okay, I'm just going to get some safety goggles on. All I'm doing with these, these wires is I'm turning this on to here. That's on. Tight them up, not much, not by much. Just slightly nip them up. They really don't carry much current at all. That's the positives all put together. <clears throat> I've done the same with the, the wire for the negative. Just to stop this moving, I'm going to Put the bolt, the nut on now.
double check that they're all tight not by much just just nipping them up okay so uh, these four cells are now connected in parallel um, in their enclosure so they're going to um, take several days now to uh, completely top balance if you do the maths uh, it's, let's say that each cell needs approximately 200 amp hours to uh, pump in that's uh, there are four of them so that's 800 amp hours that we will need to be putting in here of uh, 3.65 volts um, and that's probably going to be going at about 10 15 amps um, and so that's going to take uh, several days you do the maths you can figure that out right so let's get this into our heated enclosure it's quite cold in this barn so let's keep these warm and we have the charger ready so black are we going to put the uh, it should do it, put it over here so that I can still close the door and in the red we're going to put on the positive there right we're charging as you can see only at 5.4 amps so for the time being it'll take uh, quite a long time to top balance these four cells so we're talking about several days now we're just going to leave it running for a few days and let's um, talk about top balancing for a bit i'm going to try and explain in in a fair amount of detail what it is about and why you need to do it one of the really nice thing about lithium ion phosphate batteries is that the uh, voltage curve voltage versus state of charge curve is very flat so for a the vast majority of the uh, state of charge you've got this nice flat voltage uh, around about 13 volts on the battery <coughs> um, the difficulty with that is that it's practically impossible to determine state of charge by simply measuring voltage now when your cells arrive when let's say that you've ordered them from china or from wherever when they arrive they will generally be at about 25 to 30 percent state of charge and because they would have taken several months to ship um, from when they were manufactured uh, the chances are that some of them have uh, discharged slightly i mean you know talk about one or two percent just slightly more than others and they won't be equal state of charge anymore so what you need to do is uh, what is called top balancing which is essentially where you are going to bring all four cells to a hundred percent state of charge at 3.65 volts and there are a number of ways now the, i'll take you through the most popular way of doing it but first this is the configuration that you're aiming for ultimately is to have a negative and then a positive and a negative and a positive so basically you can connect them in series and essentially what you will have when the battery is fully um, assembled and running you'll have bus bars over here so basically this will be your main negative and your electricity flows like that and your main positive so in order to top balance uh, as you'll see our preference is clamp the cells in the enclosure and then just use any old household wire you know one and a half millimeters two and a half millimeters would be slightly better uh, to build them into series into parallel rather to achieve the top balancing there are other ways that you can do it actually the way that we tend to do a lot of our top balancing is by using these so we simply attach uh, all the positives together all the negatives together and uh, attach the charger to these uh, pigtails and that works really really well for us and we can we can use this to uh, top balance any configuration practically <clears throat> um, the i'll take you through what is the most popular way of top balancing so most people and in the most the majority of videos that you watch uh, the top balancing will be done with cells that are completely uh, out of the enclosure so they stand alone 
uh, the folk will top balance completely and then they will enclose them. We just prefer to enclose them at the lower state of charge that, you, that they arrive at because once you have top balanced them, they will swell. Every single cell will swell slightly. Good quality, less bad quality cells will swell a bit more and uh, cells that have a real problem will swell uncontrollably. So most people will actually put the the cells in parallel like this to achieve the top balancing. So essentially we've got all of the negatives here and all of the positives here. And what they'll do generally speaking they'll need six bus bars. Now when you buy the battery the cells you will buy them with a bus bar per cell. And so this is what people do. Or they'll do it the other way actually, so that they're sitting level like that. And let's do the same here. So they'll put the outer ones first and then the inner one. Nip them all down with a with a with a nut and uh, attach the charger to these. So this is how most people will achieve the top balancing. Um, as you'll see, <coughs> we decided, and this is how we do most of ours, we uh, enclosed ours. In fact, I'll get the battery out there. It has been top balancing. So let me put these cells back and I'll get the actual battery out and show you. Uh, as you can see, it, uh, it's difficult to get these exact, but 3.65, 3.67, uh, they're so close uh, and it's really dropped down. It sort of comes and goes. It's pretty much top balance now. Uh, you could leave it for a few more hours and it wouldn't uh, take much more of a charge. We could consider that these are fully top balanced. So let's uh, take these off. Uh, turn our charger off. Nice and heavy. So these cells are fully top balanced and uh, as you see we just used electrical uh, household wire. This is one and a half millimeter wire for lighting circuits in the house. It works absolutely fine. The cells are completely top balanced and what we'll do to check them is we'll simply take um, all of these bits of wires off. So I'm going to do all of the negatives and remove, uh, remove the wire so that it can't um, touch anything. So I'm going to check each of the cells in turn. Uh, 3.64, 3.64, and 3.63, 6.3, 6.4, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> so all of these cells are currently at exactly the same voltage. You can use um, a multimeter like this. Well, this is a meter that measures voltage as well as internal resistance. These are a lot more expensive than these. So the, as I said, this is about 15 12, 15 pounds on Amazon. Uh, these, I can't remember the price, but they're a lot more expensive, but they really are good. Uh, they measure both the voltage and the internal resistance. So power it on and uh, let's just see what, so that can, you can use that to help you determine. So we've got 3.654 and 0.19 resistance. So you'll see that they're all fairly similar. Uh, if you can get one of these, it's not a bad idea. They really are worth the money. Right, so <clears throat> we have uh, completed the top balancing. The cells are all in the enclosure. Uh, they have uh, basically swollen a little bit um, because of the fact that they are fully charged now. Uh, you wouldn't be able to budge them in here at all. Um, so they're nice and tight here. If we were to discharge them completely to each one being 2.5 volts 
uh, then they would actually shift around a little bit loose in this enclosure. And that's pretty much what we want. Uh, you can do it with springs and all sorts of things like that, but that's getting quite complicated. And um, actually you might just get, you know, one or 200 more cycles out of it. Um, the way that we've done it uh, should last really long. In fact, if you're my age, the battery will outlast you generally. Uh, if you're running it in an RV. So if I was to use this in my camper, uh, the battery would be something I could leave in my will, which is crazy. Right, uh, from here we're nearing the end now. So we're gonna get uh, everything connected onto here, uh, put the BMS on, and then the battery will be complete. I'm about to terminate all five of these leads, one black, four red, with um, some of these uh, connectors, lugs, whatever you wanna call them. Um, the, the wires come with this tiny bit of soldered end sticking out, which is not enough. So uh, I want to uh, bear a whole lot more. So let's see, I want roughly this much. So on each one, this is how much I want to bear. Because I'm going to fold it over and put it into the lug. I find if your um, cables are really cold that this doesn't work really well. It works really well if the cables are warmed up and the plastic is softer and more pliable. That didn't work, so what I do there is I actually just push the two down and then that grips better and it's pulled it out. Right, we have all five with a lot more wire showing. So now Turn this back over so that it's doubled like that. I get this into there. Sometimes you have to push it. There we are. It's gone in quite snug. I'm going to show you with my old, old one. So, if you can get a nice close up, I get that into there exactly where I want it. And then I, I just know from many, many years how much pressure to exert. And, you know, this, the tug test, it's completely secure. I've actually, I, d I don't think I've ever had one fail. It's crazy because you get these uh, nice new crimping tools and ratchet base and people get very upset when you use old ones like this. But I find that they are just so easy to use. I, I use the uh, modern ratchet ones. But I guess it depends on how much experience you have and how many hundreds or thousands of these things you've crimped. Completely fine. Okay, so I'm ready to crimp here. You can see these are color coded for the different size lugs. And this one, pink, red, uh, will go for this first one. Um, so these are for much bigger lugs. Now, if you look here, you see there are two sets of teeth and the metal part that you're going to crimp is the metal sleeve is not going to span both of them. So you've got to get one of those squarely in the middle. So the way I do that is that I put the out to the one on the, my right so that it is going to crimp in the other one over there. So let's go. So that's done the crimp. And the tug test is fine. I mean, it's done, it's made, it's crimped onto this bit of heat shrink, which is not going to be a problem because it's, we're going to heat it just now. But the important thing is that it is actually crimped onto there. So we've crimped all five on. And uh, these, <coughs> I'll give you the link for these, these come with the heat shrink really made on them. So now we're going to use a heat gun just to get the heat shrink to shrink. And it is adhesive heat shrink. 
Now we are going to uh, terminate the one end of our positive cable. Uh, this will be our main negative terminal, this will be our main positive terminal. Now the BMS, uh, this is the outgoing uh, power, negative power cable. So that we're going to pass through the handle here on the one side and we're going to bring the uh, positive cable quite next to it, right next to it. So let's prepare this. Uh, we're going to put this um, 35 mil, 6 millimeter hole um, lug onto here. So you can measure it or you can just eyeball it so roughly that much that you're taking off. You can take off a little bit more than you need of the insulation, that's fine. Just go around with your knife or your blade, your standing knife or whatever it is that you're using. Then cut down, open it up and peel it off. As I mentioned earlier, it's far better to have the ones that are flanged out at the bottom there, because that makes it really easy to put them onto the wire. You can see it's coming out there quite nicely. My preference is a hydraulic crimping tool. So let's get this into place. I just rest the handle down like that. Get the um, the lug into place like that and then I pump it. There we are, it started taking, make sure that the cable's in and just pump pretty hard. See that's fully clamped, not moving at all. We're going to cut off about 25 mil an inch of um, this is uh, adhesive lined heat shrink. Um, don't buy normal heat shrink, buy the adhesive lined. And that goes over there, nicely like that. And then I need the heat gun. <coughs> And there we are, that should work well. So we needed this one for the main uh, positive, which is going to pass through here. And then we're going to assemble the, the rest. We'll leave the, the final um, negative one for last to do. Um, so let's get all of the, uh, the balance leads and the bus bars on. So this balance lead this black one is going to be going on to here, which we'll put the, the BMS lug on first and then put this on. So I'm just going to put a nut on very loosely just to hold it into place. Right, we need a bus bar going across here. And <clears throat> the next, uh, next to the black one, the next red wire goes on to here. Our preference is to use a washer that stops things from spinning around. So I'll put a washer on both. Uh, get one of these um, nuts with a flange on the bottom. the first one down. Next bus bar goes there. We get the next red wire in the string. Make sure we've got the right one. And we're just going to keep on going in the same direction for now.
third best part. This means that you'll have one uh, spare bus bar that not sure what you're going to do with it. But anyway, you'll have that at the end of the process. So the last and final um, balance lead, uh, the furthest from the black, uh, will go onto this positive line here. So I've got all of these going in the same direction. This one I'm going to take straight out like that. Right, they are all ready to tighten down. Where is it? Here we are. Um, this is a, a giant uh, bicycle torque wrench, essentially. You can see we've got it set to eight Newton meters. So I'm gonna torque all of these down to their right torque here. If you don't have a torque wrench you can do it by feel. So the distance here is 110 mils from hole to hole. So let's, the, the idea is that this, uh, the BMS, is going to sit um, roughly on this side here just with enough clearance over here that's going to sit off off center roughly here i don't want to take it any lower otherwise it could touch on these terminals and we're going to bend this one round to come to the main negative terminal and the main positive we're going to take out pass through the handle here in order to get the spacing right as you can see we're going to put one of these bars on so we're going to run it about uh, two centimeters in now, I know from past experience that uh, just missing these bolts is about the right position. As you can see, if I wanted to, I could still get my spanner down here. So I'm just missing these, and this is where this is going to go down. Um, preferably, you want to drill a pilot hole. I've got a two and a half mil. You're going to want to drill a pilot hole and you're going to want to take it at a slight angle. You never want to screw or drill into the battery. So you want to be very sure that you go away like that. And same on that side. Of course, you've got all this mess that you're making here, which can clean out later on. And we are going to put this down and measure. I'm going to actually bring this uh, positive cable back out here. And I'm going to measure <coughs> 110 millimeters from center to center.
going to cable tie these um, balance leads just to keep things as neat as possible. Right, we've got our balance leads uh, and bus bars tightened down. Now we need to bring the BMS in. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> you're going to want to mount this BMS in such a way that um, you've got enough space to get the balance leads on here and that you've got clear room for your fingers. So you want to bring it over slightly. Um, it's going to need to come down something like this to get to this here. So let's get that on too. Put a washer on and then that was a temporary nut. Let me put the flange nut on. That's the main negative line on there. We have enough space to get to. There. I'm just going to stick that through there for now. And I'm going to screw down the um, the BMS with uh, with this now. There are four. Uh, holes, four, four places you can screw the BMS down. We choose to screw it down two opposite sides. And the easiest is here and here. Um, now, we use a two and a half mil screw, which is smaller than all of the others, so we use a smaller bit. So I've put the smaller bit in, and uh, I'm creating a lot of shadows for myself, so I'm struggling to see here, but anyway. I just put it in at a slight angle. Like that, nothing came through on the other end. So you can, um, these cables, the main positive and negative cables, you can place them wherever you want. Uh, quite often we'll just put them out here which leaves you enough room to grab, to lift the battery up here easily enough. Um, or you can run them outside, down the side, you know, bring the positive as well down the side there. There are a number of things that you can do with the cable, so it all depends on your installation as to where the best place is for them. For the time being, just for this video, we're going to have them just hanging out here. Everything is tightened, so now we can plug the fly the uh, balance leads into the and just bend them out of the way because when you bring to carry the battery you actually want them nicely out of the way um, you will see that it is only 3.4 something volts so let's take the uh, The Bluetooth dongle has this micro switch over here where my finger is, so I'm just going to click it on with my nail. You can see it come up to 14.5, so fully top balanced battery, 14.5 volts, it'll be coming down to its resting voltage. So we've now turned the BMS on and everything is working, the voltage is as we expected. So <clears throat> on to finishing tasks. You can decide where you want your temperature probe. Uh, we're not too hung up about it. We just sim often just simply leave it uh, loose over here because it gets the, uh, the, you really want the temperature of the cells, I guess. So it's quite fine if you wanted to tape it down to a cell. You, you want the temperature of the cells more than the BMS itself because um, you want to protect these from charging when they are less than zero degrees 
centigrade, uh, otherwise you damage them. <clears throat> so I guess if you wanted to, just tape your probe down onto one of the cells or just leave it anywhere that you want. Um, in terms of the Bluetooth dongle, you can decide how and where you want it. So we use uh, this double-sided uh, 3M tape. And I'll put this onto the back of the Bluetooth dongle. Stick it on nicely. So we're going to stick the Bluetooth dongle right over here. So we're going to show you how to uh, connect to this Bluetooth um, on the uh, daily BMS. So this is the app that you use. So you open up the app and uh, your battery will be shown there. So this number should correspond to the number that's on the Bluetooth dongle. Do not try and pair with the Bluetooth. You just open up this app and connect to it. So basically you click on it, that connects you to it and you wait a while and now it's uh, done as all of its initial comms and it's got all of the details there. So uh, this battery has just finished top balancing, so it's 14.5 volts, so that's what we'd expect to see. Now, the, the display shows you some interesting stuff like your maximum and minimum voltages, your delta, that's the kind of delta we want to see, very low delta, very good quality cells, uh, very close to each other, very closely matched. Um, this shows you the actual cells and what they are. Uh, your temperature is quite important um, because your BMS will protect uh, damage to the cells from high and low temperatures. So various bits of information there. Um, here are some settings that you are going to want to change. So I'm clicking on preferences. The first thing is that the cell volt high protect we think is too high. So we tend to change ours uh, to 3.65. Uh, I actually have mine on 3.6, but let's just say 3.65 gives us a battery of 14.6 volts. So you click set, that pops up this thing about your pass, password. The standard password is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you need to click set again. So you wait a few seconds and you see it's changed to 3.65. This one we changed from 2.2, which is crazy low, to 2.5. And feel free to make yours slightly higher. So we, again, we, we just need to click on set. We don't need to put the password in again. So wait for that and that's changed to 2.5. We swing across here and we go to temp protection, which starts off as a crazy minus 40. That is gonna damage the cells completely. We change ours to anywhere between three and five. Generally, these are these are on the, on the side of caution. So when it's actually five degrees, this will show, the BMS will show three degrees, uh, usually three or four degrees. So it's about one, it, it overreads by, uh, well, underreads by about uh, one or two degrees centigrade. So we change that to five on all of our batteries. Some folk change it back down to three or so but don't ever go less than about two because uh, even though you shouldn't charge uh, below zero degree centigrade you shouldn't uh, give it a high charge between sort of two and three degrees centigrade either so <clears throat> let's change to five so those are the settings we use coming back that's our device status everything's looking good right so this battery is now complete uh, everything done except for this uh, cable here, this main positive cable. Now I'm not going to uh, put a lug on here because uh, you will need to decide uh, where it's going to go on your van. So this will either, or your boat, or in your cottage, or uh, wherever you're using this battery. Um, you'll need to decide the length. Uh, where, is it going to a fuse? Is it going to a bus bar? Is it going to a... Um, uh, straight to the inverter, what, what are you actually doing with it? Usually we would send this straight to a fuse. So somewhere, and you could even mount the fuse. And be careful, don't screw into the battery cells. So if you're going to mount a fuse here, make sure you're not going into the cells. Or you could have a fuse in the top even, so you could bring it out or bring it out the side, the top to a fuse or something like that. So you would terminate this depending on, on your application. 
this is the main negative that uh, terminates in an 8mm lug anyway. Um, and so you'll need to decide what you want to do. This is it's going to a smart shunt or uh, to a bus bar, or are you just going to bolt something on to extend it somewhere? So this is a two American wire gauge AWG cable. Uh, this is a 35, which is the same as this. Uh, this is rated, I think, at about 105 degrees centigrade. This is rated at 200 degrees centigrade. But you can buy uh, the more expensive uh, two American wire gauge or 35 millimeter cable if you want to that's rated at the 200 degree centigrade. Uh, you'd never really reach that. I mean, it's just you're just not going to draw that much, and the BMS is only capable of 200 amps anyway, so it's going to offer some protection. So, <clears throat> um, if I compare this with uh, one of the sort of standard drop in replacement sizes. So this is one of our drop-in replacement batteries that we, we build with 150 amp daily smart BMSs with Bluetooth and everything. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's quite a bit lower than this and um, it's about the same length, I think. Total length is it's slightly longer um, and then obviously quite a bit uh, narrower. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so this is what you get with the uh, uh, with the DIY battery. Uh, I actually love it. I love this battery. I think it works really well. So um, thanks for watching and I hope that was uh, useful to you. If you have any questions or comments uh, please post them below. Uh, if you need any help feel free to contact us and uh, we'll talk you through it. Uh, we've tried to cover all of the uh, you know as, as we said in the beginning this was a, a guide for somebody who's never done anything like this and so we've tried to cover all of the aspects of building this uh, DIY custom built battery and uh, hope that uh, you manage to build yours and uh, get uh, loads of fun out of it and uh, loads of lighting or, or charges or whatever you're doing with it. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.